how to optimize the public research funding system so that it contributes to the development in our society and helps us to face societal changes. Hello and welcome everyone to this SNES seminar that is about the OECD's view on uh, Sweden's research landscape. This meeting is a part of the SNS project called the Higher, Re Higher Education and Research. And we're very happy to have the OCD with us today to give us an international perspective on these issues. My name is Julia Niederberg, and I'm a project manager here at SNS. And I would just like to welcome all of you joining us here at SNS and the ones joining us online. Um, and also, I would like to say, if you want to share the content during the seminar, you're more than welcome to use our hashtag SNS Kunskap. And the authors and the panel, you'll be introduced uh, more properly uh, further on by the journalist uh, Niklas Ekdal, who's the moderator of today. Welcome up on stage. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, and once again, very welcome to this uh, seminar on the Swedish research landscape in the eyes of the OECD. Uh, one might assume that the issue of innovation was big enough to take care of itself, uh, considering uh, the range of existential challenges that we face. But necessity is not the only parent of invention. Science is even more crucial, and most important, maybe, is policy. And Sweden has high ambitions, as always, but as always, we can learn from others. And the uh, OECD unit for science, technology and innovation now provides a timely report titled Public Research Funding in Sweden, Optimizing the System in Response to Multiple Demands. A shorter and less uh, polite headline might read Room for Improvement. And that's what we're going, going to talk about today, the next hour. So let's start with the presentation of the report. Uh, we are very pleased to introduce policy analysts, Carthage Smith and Masatoshi Shimosuka, who has uh, fought their way here in spite of some reported turmoil in Paris. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Uh, so a warm welcome to you. Uh, before you start, just a couple of very quick uh, questions. Carthage uh, Smith, you joined the OECD as head of the Global Science Forum Secretariat in 2014. Uh, how has all the international turbulence and drama since then affected uh, research? Uh, a big, yeah. very big picture in 20 yeah, seconds. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's a big question. So. Um... In 2015, we had the Paris Accord, um, and I think since then, we've realized that uh, the environmental crisis is not something for the future. It's with us. We need to act on it. Uh, we've also had COVID that completely changed the, the way we operate and also, um, you know, emphasized the, the relationship between science, policy, and the public in a big way that that we sort of talked about before, but then practically we, we had to do it. Um, and, and now we've got this geopolitical situation and we're talking about technological sovereignty. We've done reports about uh, scientific integrity and security. So there's been big changes that are really changing the way that we need to think about science, technology and innovation. We still need the stuff we did in the past, but how do we address all these new needs? And Masatoshi Shimosuka, uh, you have worked in Japan and France and lived in the, the US as well. Yeah. Uh, how does Europe and Sweden measure up against Asia and America in terms of research? You yeah, can get you, just your personal and, and <laughs> brutally honest uh, <laughs> perspective on this. Yeah, personal opinion. That's yes. I mean, the, um, I'm currently working for the OECD and uh, I'm originally from the Japanese government, uh, science ministry. I mean, and uh, I would say, so there are a lot of difference between the, in terms of culture and uh, even in the research innovation context. So the role of the government and the role of the public funding agency is completely different from each other. But at the same time, so I'd like to say there is kind of a similarity. So in terms of the leadership of the university and uh, these kind of things. 
So I would say these are related to the kind of the um, given context. As Kassage mentioned, so we are now in a really difficult moment. So in the, and the research and innovation policy require um, a lot of things to do. And uh, um, these kind of things highlight a kind of similarity in the, in the Swedish context and the other countries' context. So we are present soon, but yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. So. Thank you so much. Uh, and now your uh, observations and recommendations in this report, it's going to feed into a, a, a sitting committee that we have in Sweden. So this is a, a matter of life and death for us, almost. <laughs> so please give us your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you for having us today. So, um, how are you? I mean, I, I'm not sure how can I say it, but so anyway, so we'd like to present an OECD analysis of the public research funding in Sweden. So my name is Masato Shishimosuka, um, just call me Masa. So and, uh, I'm a secretariat of the JSF Global Science Forum and OECD. And also, um, and so, and, uh, I will present up first and the uh, passage we will, will be handling the second half of the presentation. So today we will highlight the critical parts of the report, but please find all the report uh, for more information on today's discussion. So in this presentation, um, firstly, I will introduce the Swedish R&D landscape in terms of the R&D investment and the public funders. Secondly, the methodology of this work. Thirdly, option for change and the international example. So you may sometimes feel that the real question in, in uh, research and innovation policy is not what to do, but how to do it. And the international cases from the recent OECD work will help to fill the gap. Um, here is the land intensity of the research uh, intensity of the each country. So Sweden is located at the highest land intensity. At the same time, excluding the light blue, so from the business enterprise. So in Sweden, most of the spending comes from the dark blue in the universities. So concentration in universities is one of the Swedish R&D contexts. So in order to focus on public R&D intensity, so we look at the change over time. So here is a figure for the higher education expenditure or R&D um, from 2000 to 2020. So in 2020, Sweden was a third place behind Denmark and Switzerland. It's small, but it is a third place. And, uh, but looking at the time change, other countries have been increasing their expenditure over the last 20 years. So catching up with Sweden. So these expansions of the Ireland expenditure across countries indicates the growing demand for university and public funding. So in the past, university and the public funding were expected to create knowledge. So this is classically understood from the market failure and is related to the importance of the basic research. But at the same time, they are also required to act as a resource of innovation. Beside, in addition to the knowledge creation and uh, uh, innovation, so addressing societal challenge, so as Kassage mentioned, is becoming increasingly important. So the COVID-19 pandemic and the environmental crisis highlighted this point. So recalling the response to the pandemic, um, the development of the vaccine, so it is clear how science is essential for society. And at the same time, science itself needs to work with society. So public funds expect, uh, expected to respond to this demand, but of course, resources are limited. So which means that public actors face a difficult task of optimizing the system to meet these glowing demands. So as for the Swedish context, um, there are public and the private sectors. In the public sector, the budget flows from the ministries and the um, funding agency and the two R&D performers. Also in the Swedish public funding context, university should be focused on in terms of the huge investment. At the same time, so when we look at the detail of the university income, EU and the public and private foundation are critical player for the funding. So in the next slide, uh, we will see the breakdown of the income of the university. So the figure shows the university income from the research grants by funders. 
So importantly, um, governmental funders account for less than half of the income. So the rest come from the non-governmental non sector, such as the EU and the foundations. So this highlights the importance of the coordinating public funding agency with those funders. So based on this context, um, here is a methodology of this work. So firstly, OECD has developed um, a comprehensive analysis in the OECD review of the innovation policy for Sweden in 2016. So innovation, uh, the review consists of the four areas, university research, innovation, societal challenge, and the priority strategy and the governance. So these are well aligned with the objective of the public funders and a good starting point for this analysis. So, and the contextual change after 2016 should be considered. So concentration in university and the various funding actors are also important, as I mentioned before. Beside a recent survey for the ongoing review showed that um, there are large concerns with regard to the research infrastructure. And then um, this work consists of the five years. So university excellence, research infrastructures, societal tradition of resilience, science, technology, and the innovation strategy. So which includes the coordination between the various actors. And finally, governance and structure, which is to enable these four appeals. Then I will hand over to the Kasesh uh, for the following pre presentation. Thanks, Marissa. So um, all I have time to do is give a quick overview of the, the things that are in the report. And hopefully at the end, you'll say, hey, this report sounds really interesting. And if you haven't read it, you go away and read it. Um, so the first topic we looked at was university excellence. Um, and we define that broadly. And I think that's really important to think about how you define excellence. Is it just publications? or is it broader in the light of the, the context and the challenges we've been talking about? Um, what are the challenges and opportunities that we identify? So the issues around the strategic direction of universities. This is something that we looked at in 2016 and in the reviews that have been done since then that we have looked at, it's an issue that is recurrent. Um, universities are critical in the, in the Swedish system and there's issues about strategy in universities. There's issues around the funding mechanisms for novel research, whether that's high-risk research. We, we find the, and, and these are challenges that are not just in Sweden, these are for many other countries, but there's issues around how to fund, um, to get away from just incremental research, to the sort of breakthrough research that we need, whether it's basic or whether it's to address societal challenges. And then there's issues around the, the sort of context and some of the enabling factors around that. Uh, there's a variety of examples uh, that we cite here. Um, one that I would emphasize in the context of universities is Arizona State University, which is restructured. Its whole focus now is on interdisciplinary um, departments. It has a mission. Um, there's, there's a center there that was funded by special funding from NSF, long-term funding to address in a transdisciplinary way, societal challenges. And yet in terms of research excellence, it is still one of the highest rated uh, in, terms of universe, in terms of publications, et cetera. Um, but there are other examples and some you're familiar with, I'm sure, Alto University, et cetera. And in the report, you find other examples. Our analysis um, based on this work that we've done in the past um, and looking at the 2016 review and the review since then is that there is a need to incentivize universities to, to really encourage them to take on this strategic leadership role um, and to have more risk taking and more challenge driven research taking place in universities. And that needs a strategic approach. It is clear that that is not just happening bottom up not at the scale that is needed to address the challenges we have. Um, one possibility there is to link general university funds in some way to societal challenges, to the missions of universities. There are different ways of doing this. Sweden has experimented with this in the past um, with, I think it was the SIF uh, program, but the, and there are lessons to be learned from that. 
different opportunities and a real need to promote high risk, high reward research. Um, one of the issues there is having more of a portfolio approach. So rather than saying every project must be successful, some will work, some will not, and be prepared to take the risk and assess the whole portfolio. But that means you need to assess things differently. You need to manage them differently. Um, and then a critical issue is what do we value out of research? It's a real issue that comes up recurrently about the incentives and the way we measure research. If universities are judged by league tables that are based on bibliometric scores, that's what you'll get, disciplinary focused research. And we need that. Absolutely, we need that, but we need a lot more as well that currently is not incentivized enough. Research infrastructures, um, this wasn't looked at in 2016, but in the survey that was done for this government review, there seemed to be a general concern about research infrastructures. We've done a lot of work on infrastructures um, and there are generic issues that come up and apply in Sweden. In that work, we've looked at examples from Sweden as well. Um, so issues about the long-term sustainability and that relates to the funding and the vision for the funding. Um, in Sweden, there seems to be a particular issue about choosing between national and international projects and aligning systems. Um, prioritizing within the infrastructure budget. So again, this issue of being more strategic and then different approaches between different stakeholders within the Swedish system and different expectations, uh, whether they be you know, development, economic development at the local level or, or science driven um, needs coming from, from the research community. Again, there are some examples that we quote, I'll, I'll give just one here. In Australia, they've actually managed to have a 10 year funded or funding commitment to, to research infrastructures. So that allows them to think strategically. They, the infrastructures within the national plan in Australia, they know they will have funding for 10 years, even though the budget is given every two years still. Um, so the, the fact that the budget is annual or biannual should not necessarily be a block to thinking 10 years and having some sort of commitment for 10 years, but it means planning and being strategic. Um, so the options here, again, this issue of a portfolio management strategy. So instead of just judging every individual infrastructure, look at the whole portfolio. What have you got? What's missing? What's international? What's national, et cetera. Um, Think about the long-term funding. This comes up everywhere around infrastructures. They're long-term commitments. We say they're strategic. They played a critical role in COVID, for example, and yet they're, they're always looking for the next funding. Um, robust business plans uh, for individual infrastructures, um, and we've done a report on business plans. I would encourage you to look at it. It's not just about where you get your funding. It's about many other aspects and, and a whole rounded business business plan. Um, User-based optimization, uh, again, is a critical issue we see for infrastructures. Again, in COVID, we saw that, you know, users from, uh, users to, to address COVID were using many different types of infrastructures that normally wouldn't be within their domain. And there were issues there about access. How do you make your data, for example, or your machinery, um, available quickly to new users who may not have the experience with, with that data and machinery, and yet it can really help them. Um, moving on, because we don't have too much time, societal tr transitions and resilience. And I, I think this sort of cuts across everything. You know, research infrastructures play a role, excellence plays a role. But um, Sweden has been doing and experimenting a lot in this area, and, and I think there's a lot to build on. So there's issues about Agenda setting and design, I think within Sweden, you've got many programs, but perhaps uh, the, certainly the reviews of those programs would say there's an issue about agenda setting and getting buy-in at the outset across government, across stakeholders. There's issues about implementation and evaluation, and I think there's things there that Sweden can learn from other countries and also that other countries can learn from Sweden, from its experiences. This is an area where no one has the solution yet. Everyone is experimenting and trying. Um, there are issues in Sweden, I'll come back to this at the end, about the, the missions of the funding agencies and the, the structures of those funding agencies, and that limits the challenge-driven research. Um, and yeah, we come back to that. And then again, uh, contextual factors, things like political leadership and will that are, that are really important in, in this context. 
So many international examples. I'll just mention the, the high-tech strategy in the Netherlands. So this started off essentially as a, a traditional tech innovation industrial uh, support program in a way. In its latest edition, it is now much more focused on holistically on societal challenges. It is engaging societal stakeholders much more. What's important about it is it has cross-government support at the outset, and so it really it can align those stakeholders, different ministries, different players. Uh, to my knowledge, in Sweden at the moment, that is not yet the case um, in, in the existing programs. Maybe the next version of SIP, maybe that's something that, that will come out. So options for change. Um, you do have a lot of experiences, say the, the SIPs, the National Research Program, the CDI programs. Um, and I think it's important to build on that, not just to throw it out. And there's always this tendency to create something completely new and to shut down what you've got. What we see with these sort of challenge programs is that actually everyone's learning and you need to develop stepwise from, from what you did in the past. And I think there's real opportunities here in Sweden. We need to support capacity building within the universities, as we said at the start. In a way, the funding agencies are there to leverage the research in the universities. That's their role. And so how can we support the universities to, to address these societal challenges? Part of that is about building the capacity there, whether it's fellowship schemes, network building, et cetera. Um, and then there are existing centers of excellence within Sweden. Um, there are really good examples, but they're kind of isolated. The, um, and I think you really need to identify those and build on them. Um, I, I think, you know, the Stockholm Resilience Institute comes up as one example, but the, there are surely others. Um, and, and maybe networking some of those, linking them more. Um, moving on, SDI strategy. So this issue of strategy comes up uh, uh, across the system. And, and there's, there's a need, uh, I, I think, to have a strategic vision with all the stakeholders uh, uh, across that under, underneath which other things can be organized. Um, you need that for effective collective action. Uh, you need to match the top down with the bottom up. It's great to have bottom up, but there's a limit to, to what you get out of that and the critical mass that you need. There's a limit to, to the urgency of addressing the current challenges, for example, if everyone's doing one thing and, and there's no strategic alignment. Um, that means alignment across the research funding agencies as well in, in, on some parts, not with everything. Um, and you need stakeholder engagement to develop that strategy. It's not the traditional uh, let scientists decide what they should do and put out a few broad themes and then advertise it. And, and we all do what we want bottom up under those themes. It's, it's really a different way of operating. Um, so many examples, um, I'll just highlight two here. These are recent national strategic papers that, that, that they're different. Uh, the, the New Zealand one, they really engaged all the different sectors of government um, and had dialogues with society around what should the national priorities be? What should the national strategy be for SDI? In New Zealand, it has a particular focus on the indigenous people, indigenous population. Um, islands, campaign, which is ongoing at the moment, is very much a citizen consultation campaign. What do citizens want out of science? It, it's post-COVID where they realized that, that there was this gap and actually including citizens made their research more relevant. Um, things for, for Sweden to, to think about. Options. Um, so establish this overarching national strategy. Think about how you can manage the portfolios across the agencies. Um, and uh, how that comes together, if you like, in a national picture. Um, Sweden is really interesting. The, the figure Massa presented, it's, it's almost unique in the amount of foundation funding. Um, there aren't many countries that have so much funding. Um, in terms of competitive funding, it's 50% it's of the funding. So there must be opportunities to, to align better with those foundations. Foundations also can do some things better, perhaps, you know, the high risk research, perhaps they're, they're more willing to take research than the public funders. But I think more strategic discussions and, and alignment, of course, there are barriers, you know, you, know, real, you know, genuinely and importantly between the foundations and public funding. And they have different roles in, in some senses, but 
if they can align under the same target, and this comes back to the national strategy, then I think that really could you know, trigger things in Sweden. And then finally, perhaps most controversially, the bit that you were all waiting for, so, so governance and structures. Um, so there are two real challenges. I think Sweden, in terms of traditional excellence, it's doing okay. In terms of tech innovation, you know, Spotify, et cetera, it's doing okay, um, even, even well, depending how you look at it. Um, but when it comes to socio-technical transitions, there's a gap, and that's not unique to Sweden. Sweden's up there with other countries, perhaps a little bit behind some. Uh, Austria, for example, I think is maybe ahead, but, but that's really the challenge. And, you know, we only have to look at the weather uh, um, to, to see what that challenge is. Um, and then the other challenge is more coherent agendas and policies across the agencies and across the institutions. Um, and I think those are the things that, that guide any thinking about changing the governance structures. And of course, efficiency. You know, efficiency is always there. Um, so um, what do we look at here in terms of examples? Um, I think an interesting one is what has happened recently at the National Science Foundation. So I think this is interesting for Sweden because you know, the National Science Foundation is par excellence the, the basic research funding agency in the USA. And they have now opened a new directorate, the first in 30 years, that is specifically about innovation to address societal challenges. And they're putting big funding into that. So, you know, even in the US's fundamental research uh, base, they now are opening up a major new program. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are other examples, you know, UKRI and other things that were, where this merge is taking place, et cetera. Um, so I think what's important here is the form should follow function. Uh, you shouldn't change things for the sake of it. You sh should think about why you're doing this. And as I, I gave some of the reasons earlier, um, you need something that more effectively supports STI to address socio-technical transitions. And some of the obstacles to doing that in the current system are in the report, but it's basically also linked to having diverse funding agencies with different missions. And so the, it's hard to, to join up and get the whole picture. Um, you should, I think, give serious consideration to um, reforming the governance and the structures. We suggest in the report there are two scenarios put forward. Now, these are not recommendations that to trigger uh, discussion. One of those is to have a, a closer coordination structure across the agencies, but, but one that really is empowered. Um, and the other is to, to merge uh, some, of, some of your existing agencies. We're not prescriptive about this. I would not pretend to know enough about the Swedish system as to what is the best in Sweden, but it's clear that some things in the current system, um, the, this agency structure is, is not functioning completely optimally. Um, concluding remarks. Um, so like all countries, Sweden um, is confronted with these new challenges. Um, it, it's not just about basic research and the old linear model. We, we need innovation and we really need to address these societal challenges. The universities need to evolve to do that. They need to be proactive in responding to those demands. Um, it can't all just be done bottom up. Um, funding agencies can facilitate that. Um, in some cases, they need to give a lead, give the directions. Um, but to do that, they need to have the right remits, the resources, the expertise and the governance. There's a lot of expertise in those agencies, a lot of experience, and, and you need to think how you can, can build on that. And really any reform should follow the function. So defining the needs, the strategy, addressing the weaknesses, building on the strengths, et cetera. And of course, efficiency also is part of that. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh for that refreshing outside look at Sweden. And now we're gonna add the inside view as well. So if we could please add the panel. We have here Astrid Söderberg-Widing, who is president of the Stockholm University. 
Eugenia Perez Vico, who is Associate Professor in Innovation Sciences at Halmstad University, and Mikael Dahlgren, Head of ABB Corporate Research Sweden. You say ABB or ABB in English? ABB, but, ABB. but we are okay. in Sweden, so it's okay to say ABB. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's sort of a yeah. crossover. All right, so please give us your uh, reflections on this report and what we have just uh, heard. Are there any wake up calls, do you think, for Sweden, Astrid Söderberg, Widing? Uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel, and I've read the report with great interest. And while I fully agree with its starting point, the need for excellent basic research and new knowledge, but also challenge-driven research and innovation, I do not share some of the central views expressed about how to make this happen. The report argues for the government to lead the development of an overall national science and innovation strategy, fair enough, and for the need to include public research funders in establishing it and leading its implementation as central intermediaries, uh, supporting and incentivizing the so-called research providers, including universities, to conduct necessary research and innovation activities. The research providers should be consulted, possibly also together with the general public. But in the report, the research community, and in particular the universities, is portrayed rather as research actors. And I get the impression that they are, we are taking part in a play where we merely are supposed to enact a strategy written and directed by others, politicians, research funders, and other stakeholders. And I see little reflection on the university's general role in society. I also see quite little about university autonomy or freedom of research. In the chapter entitled Redirection of Universities, these core values are rather mentioned as kind of limit to strategic work. I fully agree with the report, however, that there's too little risk taking in Swedish research today, but I also here partly disagree on the reasons. Short-term funding programs directed towards very specific goals, and we have many such programs today, are powerful steering instruments. The lack of sufficient long-term core funding makes researchers look for external money where they can find it. And in addition, the dominant publisher parish system tends to promote quantity rather than quality in academic publishing, and neither of this incentivizes high-risk research. Thank you so much. Uh, quite popular, popular <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> You'll get a chance to, to answer later. I mean, there is an obvious trade-off or conflict between uh, uh, strategy and centralized uh, decision-making and uh, the funding system and more decentralized model we have in, in Sweden, but we'll get back to that in a little while. Uh, Astrid, uh, you are originally also a film professor, right? Uh, so I wonder how universities can improve... Uh, the link between arts, humanities, and uh, innovation. I mean, transdisciplinary research. That's a, yeah. a question we haven't really touched upon. So no, far. but uh, to focus on innovation, I think we both could and we should, and we actually do. Uh, take <clears throat> just to, two local examples. The art initiative at the Stockholm School of Economics is an excellent example, or Accelerator at Stockholm University, an art space which also functions as a, as a hub for social innovation. But I also think that the funders are important here. They could support and incentivize, just like in the UK, where the Arts and Humanities Research Council has developed a, a public policy presence within UKRI. Thank you so much. Let's move on to Eugenia Perez Vico. What's your uh, most important observations in this report? Well, thank you very much for the invitation to read it and to discuss it. And I think that I will echo some of your views on this, Astrid. But I also like a lot of the point of the departure that you put forward here. I agree on the change of the contextual factors of things. I very much welcome that we reflect on how the uh, the system fun functions in relation to this. And uh, I also agree on the urgency uh, when it comes to meeting societal challenges. And given that, I agree on uh, the fact that this is a scattered and an uncoordinated system. Now, the answer, as, as you emphasized as well, Astrid, uh, that you put forward is strategy and alignment. Uh, I would rather like to think about coordination um, and uh, complementarity. Uh, and I think that that brings uh, into mind aspects of quality of diversity and also quality of coordination. 
uh, and that also puts much more emphasis about uh, the knowledge that we have in the system about the system, but that knowledge, knowledge is scattered. Uh, when we talk about complementarity, I see a call for more knowledge about the system uh, on all levels among research providers and also research funders. Uh, and that, that's something that I really would like to see a bit more emphasized in the report, uh, knowledge and competence about the system as a whole. I, I think that we know a lot about our own operations and our organizations, but we know, need to know something about our role, and that includes knowing the other. Uh, I also see a clear shift here, here when it comes to power dynamics. Uh, this report related to the 2016 report shifts the focus from university management onto research uh, uh, funders, uh, which in a way is positive because then they have to learn more about the system, about the realities of universities and about uh, researchers. Uh, I not only uh, uh, sort of uh, lack the, the view uh, the perspective from the university, university management, but also from the researchers, the providers, there's people, individuals, groups, etc. Uh, so we have to acknowledge that there is in fact a focus, a shift in focus here, where we give more mandate um, and allow more steering uh, uh, that sort of shifts one step further away from the ones that are doing research. Uh, and there's a lot of, of uh, challenges related to that, uh, related to autonomy, but also knowledge about the realities of research. Thank you. Uh, and you hold a, a PhD in environmental systems analysis, right? And you have worked with the uh, Vinova and the Swedish Energy Agency as well. Is there anything in this uh, OECD report of particular interest regarding the, the energy uh, transition? Yeah, I think when it comes to that, we uh, have to really acknowledge the fact that uh, knowledge and innovation is really a double-edged sword. That means that we, this system has been part of creating the problem where we are right now. Uh, at the same time, it has also come up with a lot of solutions. So we have to acknowledge that. Uh, and then given that, given the urgency that we have, uh, with the energy transition, I think that we have to reflect much more uh, on the long-term consequences of the research that we fund and also take responsibility uh, from that. And I, I do, therefore, I, I very much welcome your suggestions on, on revising the way that we assess research. Uh, and I think that we also need to ask ourselves, what are the long-term consequences uh, when it comes to social justice, when it comes to building new uh, resource dependencies, etc. Um, this also means, I mean, looking at the energy transition and speeding and scaling it all up also means talking about not only transdisciplinary research, but also translational research. Uh, so given the urgency of things, we do have to think more about knowledge uh, creation and, and diffusion when it comes to translating what we already know uh, and speeding up how that is applied in society. And I also see that you emphasize that in the report. So that's also very welcome. Now, something that I do uh, miss, uh, which I think is very important when it comes to any type of transition in society is the link between education and research. Now I know that we're talking about research funding here, but at the same time, I mean, many times it's very easy to look at, you think, okay, how is science made useful? Well, it's innovation, it's new things, it's solution, it's technology, et cetera. But we have tons of students at our universities today. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity to make science useful, to speed up uh, the way in which we diffuse the knowledge that we produce. And that has implication for how we fund research, what we fund, what we ask for, how we set up different funding initiatives. Uh, and that also has implication of, of how we uh, distribute funding and, and education at, on an institutional level and individual. And I would like to see that a bit more. Thank you. Finally, Mikael Dahlgren. Oh. Mikael Dahlgren, the, the ABB perspective <laughs> on the report. I can take a little bit of industry perspective. First of all, I think the report is well written. And I think it's a lot of conclusion that really makes sense in the report. If I take a little bit more an in industrial perspective, because of that I think you invited me for. Um, but I think we are in a lot of challenges in the world. And I think one of the things that we'll solve it 
is to accelerate research and innovation in technology to be able to do that. And then it's not enough just to have the university doing research. We need to have a system that works together. We from the industry, together with the institute, together with the university, we can actually develop these things. We need to play together. And I was missing a little bit that point in the report because it was very much focused on research at the institute, at the universities. Uh, and you have to remember in Sweden, which I like, like that to show, that we spend roughly 70% from the business. Technology sector where I come from, that's 50% of that. So we are quite a heavy R&D country from an industry perspective. And this means that we really need to get this working. Otherwise, if we don't have a focus on it, I'm afraid that Sweden will now fall back on this curve. We are still really good on the top. But if we don't start to invest the next level, and here I think the state needs to increase, and we need to increase the R&D funding for the university. Because if you do that, you will attract more capital to the private sector as well to invest in it. And this kind of positive spiral we need to come. Unfortunately, I see a little bit negative spiral at the moment that we see from large industries like ABB, other countries are now investing. Interesting to put our R&D in those countries. So you have to re realize that we are in a competitive mode. And so I think that's very important. And then we need to think long-term because we need to think the long-term and that I like with the report. And we need to form this kind of arenas where we can collaborate at the university. And I would say we are fairly good in Sweden. We are not bad at it, but I think we can do more on that. And then what I really like, and you were a little bit humble that you said that we have something to do on our government set up on the structure. I think we need to take a radical thinking about it. We have too many funding organizations. We need to either coordinate them quite heavily or reduce them. It's not nice to say, but I think that's what we need to do. And we need to make it more simplified. I also like what you wrote about this finding a national strategy on technology and innovation. I think that is also needed and that's why we need to do. But I think it's that we cannot just leave to you at the university. We need to do it together. We need to define what is needed from an industrial point of view. And then you, we can challenge, and then we get something that makes sense. So uh, with that said, I think uh, we need to invest and also invest in the education because we need the competence. And you have to remember university from an industry perspective, it's nice that you do research, but actually this is the competence that we offer, it's the people that we educate. And if you're good enough, we get those people and you need to have the, actually the research. Other thing that we need to do in Sweden when we put on the strategic uh, technology and innovation, we need to focus. We are too much scattered in our system. And this has actually come back into this uh, funding scheme that there always someone that is prepared to fund. I, I stopped there. I can't speak for everyone. <laughs> this is really important. I detect a sort of a, a slight difference here between the public and, and the private in, in Sweden as well. And also this tension between strategy and more decentralized model, if you will. I think you're right in the report, uh, a lack of strategic leadership and clear direction across the system. That's a rather harsh uh, judgment on the, on the Swedish system, but isn't that a strength as well with this decentralized uh, funding and the model we have? Um, so uh, I think diversity is important. Um, but the, the problem with having no sort of overarching strategy is that you end up, you, you do lots of things, but you don't necessarily have the critical mass in the areas you need to address. And in the current situation, you know, we're facing a, an existential crisis. We have to transform our systems. Do we think that the current science system is, is doing that? Uh, uh, do we think that that is working effectively against the time scale against which we have to operate? Uh, if you do, and then that's fine, and, and maybe we don't need to change things. <laughs> but I think what we saw in COVID when we were up against a crisis was there were lots of problems in, in different parts of the system, and they were mainly 
about what are the priorities, what should we be addressing? We, we start, we just call it a biomedical crisis, and then we realize actually it's a much bigger social crisis, but we should have known that from the outset, but all our different groups of knowledge providers, the different disciplines were separate, they couldn't get together. We had a, a gap with the, between science and policy in most countries, I'm not talking just about Sweden. We had a real gap between the public, public expectations and science. And, and we basically the message from that is there are many things we need to change and we need to be more strategic about that. Um, and that just doing it all bottom up gives us lots of things and we need that, but it's not gonna give us the answer to if we really think that, that science and innovation can can help us address those challenges. Um, can, I, can I ask, Astrid and Eugenia there, do you agree that the sort of urgency of the situation changes this equation somehow, the need for more strategic uh, direction? There is certainly an urgency. I totally agree there, but I liked what Eugenia said about coordination and complementarity. I actually also liked what you said in the presentation, which I really didn't find in the same way in the report. Uh, it is necessary to define needs to address weaknesses and build on strengths. And of course, if that is a strategy, it's good because you then go, depart from where we are, where we stand. But I, I, I disagree that we should completely uh, change the whole system because there I've, I'm afraid that uh, it might lead to organizational changes were <laughs> that defined by form rather than function, which you argue for yeah. function, so. Uh, no, I mean, uh, the word strategy uh, has various meanings. I don't, I think there's many ideas that pops up in the head just in this room when it comes to strategy. I mean, it, it could really mean uh, something quite, uh, quite top down, uh, it could mean something that is not very transparent. Uh, it could also mean uh, direction, you know, directionality, uh, paving the way for collective action, you know, prioritizing together and that sort of thing as well. Um, I, I, and I sort of welcome the, the discussion about strategy and direction, but more from the perspective of learning and understanding and understanding each other, what we do, our roles, et cetera, what we want. Uh, now I see a big challenge when it comes to um, creating a shared vision uh, around what the system should do. If you just think about the, the problems we have, I mean, during the, the, the last elections in Sweden, when it comes to just painting out a, a picture of what type of society that we want. I mean, we're very focused on the transition, the change, et cetera, but what is it that we want? What is the vision? So I, I, I wonder how far we will get in, in uh, taking on such a process when it comes to providing us with clear answers. However, I do welcome it uh, as a process of reflection and learning and, and understanding each other. We're going to take some questions shortly also from you uh, in the digital audience. You can, uh, write your questions and we'll get around to them in a few minutes, just a few minutes. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from the sitting committee who has actually commissioned this uh, analysis in the first place. Uh, but just to, to round up the, the panel here, a very short uh, word about the, uh, the most obvious low hanging fruit that you would send on to the, to the sitting committee. What do you say, uh, Mikael Dagen? Uh, two things, increase the funding of uh, national research in Sweden, and the other thing is simplify the system. Uh, make sure that any change in mandate or power will come also with increasing knowledge and competence. I think the need really is for funders and universities and other stakeholders to work together. I think dialogue is very much needed. So I hope that you will be guided by this vision of, of more dialogue across the whole sector. Masatoshi, what's the most uh, crucial thing you would send on to our committee? So as for the public funding, funding agency, I would say the alignment between the foundation and the funders, public funders. So funders need to understand what's going on to the other area. So it's not only for just public funders, but also there's many funders in Sweden. So it's quite important to understand each other. Mm. This is my message. So 
So interestingly, although Astrid started off by saying, as a lot I disagree with in the report, I'm now going to absolutely agree with what you just said. <laughs> I think that is the, the real window of opportunity. The critical thing that has to happen is that everyone's an actor and all the actors have to work together to build the common understanding, be, build a strategy, think about do we need reform to structures or not? What are the problems? What are the weaknesses? What are the strengths and how do we address them? Um, so yeah, we, we end up agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> we like that in Sweden. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll just uh, get around with a microphone for you and please present yourself. Okay, uh, Pontus Brownio, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, I have a question concerning quality. I have been digging through the OECD data for another purpose, but obviously Sweden ranks very high when it comes to research expenditure, research to the universities, higher education spending, and also publication per thousand inhabitants. But where we fail is when it comes to impact of our research. And that seems to me a worrying sign. So we need to design quality indicators because this has to do with the uh, position of Sweden as a knowledge society, society in more respects than the, even industry, not only research. And you mentioned something about that in your presentation, but it was more like we should sit down and talk about this. But did you have any more concrete ideas how to uh, design quality indicators for research? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um, right. So in terms of examples, I think the Netherlands is quite interesting at the moment. Um, uh, and Europe generally is, is looking at the whole research assessment process. I think before you come up with the indicators, you need to work out what, what do we really value, what do we want? And then the question is, how can we come up with the indicators and measure that? And at the moment, essentially what we want is high impact publications. And of course, they're really important. You know, they measure the knowledge output of science and that's fundamental. But we don't we measure the outputs there. We don't even know the impact of that. That's, but for the new things that we want, addressing societal challenges, e even innovation where we still use patents and we know the problems with that. So I think we need to really sit down, yes, and say, what do we really want? And then how can we measure it? And there are lots of countries who are working on this. Say the Netherlands is revising its whole uh, research evaluation system, starting with how individuals are assessed and promoted. And that's a critical part of this. You know, if we want transdisciplinary research, young transdisciplinary researchers will not necessarily have high impact publications. So when it comes to, can we give them a permanent post? It's, oh, but look at your CV, you've got nothing in nature or science. And yet they may have contributed hugely, you know, at a local level or, or to, to real change. So we need to think about what we want out of it. And that's where the discussion is before we jump to indicators that we can quantify, et cetera. Thank you. Question over there. Hans Ellegren, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, I support Astrid Söderberg-Widings uh, very well. I take like the point that the direction alluded to in the report actually runs the risk of threatening the independence and the autonomous role of universities. Uh, I, I argue that that's, like Astrid, that's a very uh, essential pillar of de democracy. And I think there is kind of an overbelief that politically defined or reach, research strategically defined programs will sort of be the solution. I think there's an overbelief that that can sort of drive the scientific process. But what we have learned about the things we learn today are not the result of strategic programs. It's the result of uh, human uh, creativity, curiosity, and intelligence. And I think uh, anything that sort of puts sort of limits on that uh, and threatens actually the scientific process. Thank you. Well, back to you, Cottage. Strategy doesn't seem like so, a very popular so, word. So this was the one thing I was sure that we would have as a, a, as a discussion here. Um, and really, I think there's a misreading of the report. If you think that it is saying we, we don't need university autonomy and academic freedom. In, in the current world, we need absolutely to protect those more than ever. Um, but that we also need to move away from its basic investigator-driven versus the rest, and one is better than the other. 
That's what I say. We need to redefine excellence. We need to think about all the things we want out of research. We need to think about the third mission of universities being as important as the first mission and the second mission. And it's not about academic freedom versus control. Uh, certainly in, in, a, in a society like, like Sweden, I, I could not imagine that, that you know, you've got a long way to go before you would end up with the, the control of the universities. Uh, um, but and that's why we say it. the universities have to be, be leveraged, be supported, be helped. But they have to take the leadership role. They have to control this rather than it being them told what to do. Um, I would just say that, you know, on the report, we were only asked to look at the public research funding. It wasn't a report about universities. But we realized that, you know, the universities are the critical players. What are the funders doing? They have to leverage, they have to work with the universities. They're the ones who are going to do the research. So that, you know, we haven't focused on all the issues around universities. And, and I'm, I'm sorry if it comes across that there's uh, some misinterpretation that we're, we're, we're saying it all should be driven by the government and universities should just obey. That is absolutely not what we're, we're trying to say. Thanks. Uh, we have two more questions. We'll just take the digital one first, Julia. Yes, um, this question is from Stefan Foreus, and I think it's quite similar to the ones Hans just asked, but he agrees with Astrid. University autonomy should balance strategic and programmed research. In Sweden, there is a tendency, especially from founders, foundation funders, to not fully reimburse work at universities. This, in effect, undermines autonomy at, at, as universities' own funding uh, own funding must be challenged towards granted project. Do you have any thoughts on that from the OECD? Yeah, university accounting is, is yeah. Um, um, so we hear this in all countries. We hear it about the European Commission funding and foundation funding that universities are subsidizing that, that funding. Um, I... I don't know the answer, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't know any country that has really come up with it with an answer to it. All right, so final question, please. Uh, Lars Engvall, Uppsala University. Uh, I have a related comment, and you said that uh, bottom-up is not enough, uh, but I think you need to look at the bottom, because uh, it's at the bottom that people do the work, and uh, I think uh, that uh, the Swedish system has indeed a problem. Uh, it's not only infrastructure, it's a problem of recruiting a new generation. Uh, if you look into 10 years or so, we might have great problems there because uh, Swedish students, don't, they are declining going into doctor education. We are recruiting international students. They defend their theses, but they go away. So didn't you see that? So, um, so we we didn't look at the research workforce issues. We we basically we had to do this report in two months, and we were given a limited remit. It was really the focus was on the public research funding. We didn't get into education, as I say. We we looked at because universities were so critical. We put them in there. There are some references in the report to issues around precariat. We've done quite a lot of work around research funding and, and precariat, et cetera. Just to be controversial to finish, um, <laughs> in the 2016 review, one of the conclusions of that, and I think it's actually written in a report, certainly came through in the discussions, was there was an increase in, in the core funding that went to universities. And that was supposed to be to, or one of the aims of that was that universities would give more permanent positions and some of the people who are in precarious posts would get permanent positions and there'd be better career paths. And on the whole, what we saw is superstars were recruited to get more short-term people on soft funding. So it's not just an issue about how much core funding there is in a university. It's a, it's a real issue about a strategy, sorry, but a research <laughs> workforce that different stakeholders need to buy into. Uh, we didn't get into it in a big way because, in a way, the research funding agencies, they, they're not the employers, they're not the direct funders, they may support some fellowships of things. Thank you so much. We have to move on, unfortunately, because we could go on all day. But thank you so much for, for sharing your insight, all of you. All right.
So that was Carthage uh, Smith, Masatoshi Shimosuka, Astrid Söderberg Widing, Eugenia Perez Vico, and Mikael Dahlgren. Thanks again. Uh, and finally, to help us look uh, forward, then we have the head of the committee for an efficient organization of public research funding, Ingrid Pettersson. Uh, the OECD here, they suggest a serious reform of governance and structures for public funding of research in Sweden. So let's hear what you take away from, from this, uh, this report. Thank you very much. And first, I would like to thank Kartis and Massa for coming here to Sweden, even if it could have been a strike last night. And also thank you to the OECD for the report in a very short time. I think it's very valuable to have an outside view, somebody else looking at our system, because when we look at ourselves, we cannot really see what's happening, and not put it in relations to others. And what you say to us is I think that research in Sweden has high quality, but that the investments in the latest R&D bills has not really paid off. They have not paid off in uh, publications in uh, very prestigious journals, not really in societal challenges or in, in other things. We are investing a lot, we are doing well, but we could do better. And I think when I read the report, you refer back to the, the uh, OECD review in 2016. And I think very few of the recommendations have been been implemented. So we have a system which is really resistant to change. And I think that is for good and for bad. Because uh, research is a, you need to have a long term perspective. So you should not change all the time. But sometimes it really has to change and take a new direction. And uh, maybe this is because there are so many stakeholders and funding organizations. So it makes it very difficult to get a consensus and it can be crippling. And I think when I have visited other countries and uh, looking at them, I think we probably have a reform deficit. There has happened very little the last 10 or 15 years at a more structural level. And I also agree with you, Eugenia, that uh, I think that we should learn more about the system to have a systematic approach. And I know a lot about funding, less about the uh, providers. of so, so we have to learn about each other to, to make a better system in total. In the report, you write quite a lot that you would like to see more leadership and maybe I shouldn't say strategy, maybe I could say direction. Uh, we are going somewhere and at all levels. And I can agree. I think that Sweden would benefit from an, and I say overarching national strategy for developing the research and innovation system, and also strategy which we can use when we collaborate in the European Union. Or we are all talking or going at this at this, in the same direction, maybe not totally the same way. So uh, I'm more in favor of strategy some, than some of the people in the panel concerning the governance and structures of the public funding organizations in Sweden, you show two scenarios. You have one scenario with modification to the remits and coordination mechanisms for the existing funding agencies, and you have one more radical stru structural changes and mergers. When we started to look at this uh, trying to clarify the remits and put the different programs in, in the right box. I think we ended up in a radical change. So I, I think that's probably the way forward. But for me, independent 
of how the system is designed. We need to have a collaboration and dialogue because there are always pros and cons independent on which model you are choosing. So, so we have to do this together. I think I stopped there and I'll say once again, thank you. According to the OECD, it's difficult for Sweden to have this strategic approach to research since we have such a variety of, of funding. Was that your impression uh, there as well when you were to sort of head, hands on uh, from FORMAS? I would say yes. I, I think we had a very good collaboration between the funding organizations, but we were different organizations and there were not a really clear strategy. So sometimes I did it my way and the others did it their way. So we could be at uh, meetings in the European Union where one funder said yes, the other one said no, and one said maybe. So we seem to come back to the to the word strategy. That could be a whole philosophical seminar as well, mm -hmm. what we actually mean when we say that, uh, as someone pointed out. Uh, and your committee now, it's expected to uh, to deliver conclusions in September. Uh, could you say now right away what sort of points from this report that you might include and uh, what the most thorniest issues are, at least? If I start with the most thorniest issues, I think that we are talking about the system and we are just, just looking at the part of the system. So there are many other parts, uh, the um, independence of the universities and uh, other things, which also maybe have to be reformed. Or... So we're just looking at part of it. And I, I think that's quite difficult. Another thing, I think infrastructure. I think infrastructure is both how the funding, because it's very costly, but also the governance about, about the infrastructure. And uh, what have I, I learned from the, um, from the report, I think uh, everything about uh, the uh, funding and maybe the role about funding organizations and uh, that you can do it in, in different ways. And for me, it's also about direction. But I also think this, that you have, when you are funding research, it's not one kind of research. You, ha you have different kind of research where you might use different tools, different forms of governance and different instruments. And what about all this turbulence that we have around us now, uh, like banks going bust in America that uh, funded uh, re small startup tech companies there, for instance, uh, and the drama in all kinds of ways. Does that feed into the uh, the committee as well? or I think not really into the committee, but as we have so much private funding in Sweden, and uh, the private funding is on, in the stock market, we could see when in the beginning of the pandemic that uh, it went down. So I think uh, it has to be the public uh, funding who is really in one way the core funding and is, is the base for uh, the direction of the funding landscape in the future. And even more crucial in a, in a volatile situation. It could be so, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Thank Petrson. you. And uh, uh, good luck with your important uh, committee. That concludes today's excursion in the Swedish research landscape. And we are very grateful for all this input. So thanks to the OECD, to our experts, uh, to you in the audience, and of course the SNS. And one final word back to project manager, Julia Nederberg. Thank you, Ingrid, for your concluding remarks. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of SNS, thank you, Niklas, Karthigi, Masatoshi, Mikael, Eugenia, Astrid and Ingrid. Uh, and of course, you in the audience. Uh, if you're interested in this research project, higher education and research, uh, have an eye out for our calendar. And on the 3rd of March, on the 3rd of May, uh, the economist uh, Olof Eymo and Jotam Sofer, they will present their report on uh, 
the development of transformations uh, from colleges to universities um, and uh, the effect on productivity. Yes, thank you and welcome back.